Turn with me to Luke chapter 24, verse 12 of 24, and I hope you brought your Bibles with you. Then arose Peter and ran to the sepulcher, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes. Sometimes, these are just thoughts I run before I get to where I'm going. He stooped down. Sometimes you have to stoop down to see better. When you're standing on tiptoe, you can't see as well as when you stoop down. It pays to be humble. And he saw the clothes, wondering in himself, what has happened? Now, verse 13, And behold, two of them went the same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about eight miles away. And they talked together of all these things which happened. They were discussing. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, two things, reasoning, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were, were, were blinded or holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk? And here's the powerful question I'm going to ask you. And why are you sad? Why are you sad? I'll drop down to verse 28. While they were talking, he explained to them the scriptures. Verse 28, and they drew nigh unto the village where they were going. And he acted as if he was going further. And they constrained him, begged him, beseeched him, implored him. And this is a strong point I'm going to emphasize. Abide with us. For it is towards evening, and the day is far spent. And he went and tarried with them. Came to pass as he sat at meat with them, he took bread. So the second time he'll be doing this, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave to them. Their eyes were opened and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. And my topic is taken from this text, verse 30, the power of communion. And the rest of the story is the blessings of communication. How we talk to each other, how we commune, what are we reasoning about? And the big picture is the question, why are you sad? And the answer is in verse 32, and they said one to another. There's a communication again, and they said one to another. Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened up the scriptures? And the theme is from sadness to gladness. It can happen to you today. You have lived a life so far, and all you have experienced is hard time bad times, sad times. You have wept more than you have laughed. Your life has become one of a long chain of sorrow. Day after day, you wake up and you feel lost and you feel helpless and you lost that hope that uh, things could change. I have news for you today. If you will hear his voice and open up your heart and let his words burn inside of you, you can turn your sadness into gladness. Can I hear somebody say amen? You know why I put this here? A tired beat of the pulpit. So I am going to beat this. That, that's why they're here. And when you hear this, you need to clap. Let's practice. <laughs> Hallelujah. As pastor said, we have a reason to be happy. We have let the world take our shout away. I like that. 
gone in the baseball and in the sporting arena and they jump and they're a little ball. A little ball. And they ball. And somebody removed the stone and we stay quiet. I want you to shout because you know the Lord Jesus today. Hallelujah. The power of communion, the blessings of communication, turning your sadness into gladness. And so, they, verse 15, and they were, while they were talking, they communed together and they reasoned. And Jesus came by and he would clarify the mystery of the resurrection because there are times, they, they, they couldn't understand what just happened. Disappointed. They said, oh my gosh, this is not what we were hoping for. See, life will present itself in such a way that you get confused. And when you wake up some days, it's not what you expected. It's puzzling. And you begin to reason. And you wonder, where did you go wrong? Didn't you pray enough? Didn't you read your Bible? Yes, you've done all of that. But, but now you are confused. And now you are bewildered. And you're walking with your brother and your sister. And you're talking. And you just can't understand what just happened. And so, not only that, but they were disappointed because things didn't turn out the way they expected. And that's why we get disappointed. Because we're expecting certain things. And if it doesn't turn out that way. They were expecting him to walk in Jerusalem triumphantly on a white horse. As the redeemer of Israel from the Roman oppression. And that he would pronounce himself Messiah. And establish the kingdom of Israel. And give the Jews rule again over Israel and, and Palestine. But that did not happen. They did not expect such a failure. He disappointed them. They all said. He failed them. And I'll be honest with you. As a pastor. As one I'm studying this word for years. There are times when I feel disappointed. I really feel that God should have done it this way. Or that way. Why did you have to do it this way, Lord? You know why? Because this way is his way. Amen. This way is his way. And sometimes you have to conclude that his way is the best way. Yeah, when you're not custom hitting anything. <laughs> so, while they were talking, in the confusion, Jesus himself, not anybody else, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. And, and here's the point. Sometimes you're walking and you think you're walking alone. Because you don't feel him. But there are times he will be with you and you don't have to feel him. You just have to know that he said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Lord, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. Now, I ain't going to point that again. This is easier. Whoa. Hallelujah. Thank you, George. And so, he was, you know we sing that song, draw me nearer. Draw me nearer. While the converse is happening, he is drawing nearer. You can rest assured that wherever you're walking, Jesus is always drawing nearer to you. Give him glory. Whether you feel it or not. Whether you understand it or not, I am so happy to announce that Jesus is always drawing closer to his people. And we can have that confidence of his presence. But their eyes 
were beholden. They, they couldn't recognize him. That's another thing. Failure to recognize Jesus in our midst and in our walk brings disappointment. And unnecessary depression. Because we're seeing the problem. We have been disappointed. Our expectations are not met. Up comes this stranger and is asking me a funny question. What are you talking about? Whose business is it? We're, we're talking about things. What happened? Are you a stranger? Are you a stranger? Aren't you only a stranger in Jerusalem, verse 18, and you don't know what things have come to pass in this state? Let me tell you something. Jesus is not a stranger to your situation. Oh, he knows everything about you. You don't have to inform him. You don't have to explain things to him. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you've been through. And he knows what you're going to go through. Oh, he ain't no stranger. Make him your friend. He will never be a stranger. So they ask him, you, you, you're just a stranger? You don't know what's happening? I tell you, you don't have to tell him. He already knows. Omniscient Christ, the unsurpassable one. Think of who's walking with you. Think who has joined the conversation. It's not, 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 not anymore two brothers talking. There is now a third person in a three-way conversation. And he's communicating to them. Things that they should have known. And he began from Moses and explained all the scriptures concerning himself. I tell you, there's no teacher like Jesus. Amen. We have some men who are gifted, like Mick is a master teacher. But there is no teacher like Jesus. When he opens up the scriptures and brings through the spirit of revelation by the Holy Spirit, he will teach you what nobody can teach you. Let Jesus be your teacher. And then the other guys will follow. So he, he said, what is this communication? What are you talking about to one another as you walk and are sad? And I am asking you that question. Why are you sad? What happened recently that brought you sadness? Did you lose a good friend? Somebody who was talking so well with you for years. And suddenly they drop you. No explanation. And you feel sad because you love that friend. And that friend used you and you thought you had a friendship. And you thought you had a relationship. But you were just a host. With the most. And they mosquito you. You know what mosquito you mean? They suck your blood and they left you dry. And you're heartbroken. And you're walking and you're, you're looking for somebody to talk to. And here is one of the problems in churches today. We can't find good people to talk to. Because when you tell them your problem, everybody else gets to hear it. And so there is lack of trust. But these two brothers, these two disciples seem that they can trust each other. And they were talking. But they were sad. Jesus recognized their sadness, their gloom and doom attitude. Why are you sad? You lost your job. Money is slow in coming. You don't have enough to pay your bills. You trying to borrow and the bank will not lend you. You ask a friend or you thought about asking a friend and you say, no. I would rather do without than ask people. That's good. Ask God first. He will never fail you. So why are you sad? Why are you sad when God, who is your father, is the most powerful being on earth? Why are you sad when Jesus is alive? Why are you sad when you have a God that is, you know, you know, this, I love how the psalmist, my help comes from the Lord. And by the way, he's the maker of heaven and earth. 
Look who is your helper. Look who is your helper. The maker of heaven and earth. Why are you sad? Why are you sad? Why are you living in gloom and doom? Your child is sick. You've been going to the hospital regularly. Your mom is sick. Your dad is sick. Your brother is sick. The family is experiencing sickness. And it has come and hit you very hard. And you're sad. And nothing could cheer you up. Actually tearing you up. Inside is hurting and paining. But I have good news for you. He is able to take your sadness and turn it into gladness. You can walk out of this house glad, happy. A sudden eruption of internal joy. It can just come inside of you and rupture your sadness and bring you into glorious rapture. Hallelujah, somebody. Verse 21 said, but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside, today is the third day. Yeah, I don't want to prophesy, but I could say some things could only last for three days. <laughs> you might be going through rough, but let me give you up to Wednesday. Let me believe with you that by Thursday you will see a change in your family. A change in your income, a change in your household, a change in your relationship, a change in your job, a change in your family. Let me believe that in three days, it will, you will rise into a new level, in a new dimension, in a new favor of God. Let me prophesy a positive word to you. He is alive. He's walking with you. You have no reason to be sad. He will turn your sadness into Say it with me, gladness. Hallelujah. Verse 26, and they drew near to the village where they went. And this is Jewish courtesy. He couldn't walk in with them. He just had to keep on going as if he's going. Very important for you to notice. Watch the next few lines. And he acted like it's, he was going further, but they constrained him. The word constrained them mean to ask with force, to insist. They actually held him back. And this is where I want to really sink in our hearts. They constrained him saying, abide with us. Oh, what a prayer. Abide. Come dwell with us. Come into our home. Come into my situation. We sing that lovely hymn, Abide with me. Abide with me. While on others, thou art calling, do not pass me by. Would you somehow find strength to say that prayer? Abide. I want Jesus to stay in my life. No matter what surrounds me, I am asking, please, Lord, abide with me. Abide with my family. Abide with the church. Abide with you. Abide, abide, abide. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done. It's all in the abiding. It's all in the abiding. Hallelujah. And in the residing. Hallelujah. Somebody shout amen. Glory to God. It's the best prayer I can pray. Abide with me, Lord. They said it's evening time. In God's clock, it is evening time. The day of the Gentiles is closing. And the time is coming when no man can work. God's clock is striking six o'clock. In the Jewish calculation, six o'clock is the end of the day. And it was about that time. It was dark. And the darker it gets, is the more we should pray. Stay with us. The night is coming. We don't want to spend a night without Jesus. 
And so he went in with them. Came to pass as he sat down to eat. Jewish hospitality. You never go in a house and they don't feed you. We have some Jews here, right? <laughs> Who just love to cook. My wife is a Jew. She just loved to cook and give people. And I wonder sometimes why she goes to such extent. Nobody asks her. Friday, Thursday, the largest pot of pilau I saw in our house. I'm not exaggerating. The pot was this big. I said, girl, where are you going with all that food? There's only five people coming to work. He said, I just going to feed them and let them carry as much as they want because they like my pillow. <laughs> Thank you, sweetheart. You are a hostess with class. I love you. <laughs> and next month, I'm going to say it again <laughs> because you're going to make it 52 years. <laughs> 52 years that girl put up with me. such grace. Abide with us for the evening. The day is fast spent. And he went in and tarried with them. May he come and tarry with us. May he stay with us. It came to pass as he sat at meat, he took bread. The power of communion. I have never underestimated that little piece of bread that you take, whether it's a biscuit or a Whatever it is, it represents. But he took bread, ordinary bread that they had cooked or baked in the house, and he broke it. Was he re breaking his body? He said, This is my body, and he gave it to be broken. Was he redoing it again? Was he repeating the act of breaking his body? No! There is something supernaturally mysterious in the breaking of bread. Better yet if Jesus breaks it for you. That's why we come in his presence on a communion Sunday. And we break bread and have fellowship. And when he gave it to them and they ate of the bread. Here's the power. And their eyes were open. The power of communion is that God will open our eyes that we may see things that we couldn't see in our reasoning and in our human senses. Things that don't make sense will now suddenly make sense. And you see, when you, you don't, things don't make sense, you end up talking nonsense. And he has a way of putting sense into our nonsense. And the best way to do, I have communion in my, my little office there. And every Sunday, I don't wait for first Sunday. Anytime I feel to take communion, I pop one of that and I have communion with my Lord. And he opens my eyes and I see his glory and I see his power and I feel his anointing. And I feel the grace of God because there is power, wonder, working power in the shed blood of the Lamb and in the broken bread. I encourage you to, to take communion with wholehearted uh, cleanliness and, and holiness and see the power. Let him open your eyes. Paul prayed in Ephesians and Colossians. I pray that the eyes of your understanding be open. Some of us, our eyes are closed. And we see what we shouldn't see. And what we should see, we're not seeing. What they saw was not the whole picture they saw him crucified. They didn't see him busting the tomb and coming out. And so they're sad. And I'm wrapping up now. And they knew him for the joy of knowing him. I don't think there's any other Method in which the believer can know Jesus as knowing him in communion. In that act, there's a deepening relationship. There is an entry into another level, into another realm. That only breaking of bread and fellowshipping with him 
could open up to us. And he vanished out of their sight. Once you are in fellowship with him, you don't need to see him physically anymore. Because your eyes are open. You can see him in the spiritual dimension. Because your eyes are open, you can see him walking with you. Because your eyes are open, you can see your tomorrow is graciously blessed. Because your eyes are open, you can see better now. You saw bitter, now you will see better. Hallelujah, somebody. Because he opened your eyes. Saul was a mighty man in scripture when he fell off his horse. The Bible said three days later, scale fell off his eyes. And he saw perfectly what God wanted him to see. There are many people who have scales on their eyes. And they cannot see, the, they hear the voice of God. They're in the bright midday sun. But they can't see. I pray our eyes be open. And they testified one to another. Did not our heart burn with us? From heartache to heartburn. Not GERD, not G-E-R-D. Not acid reflux. They didn't have acid reflux. There's a different kind of burning that the word produces in the human heart. Ah, Jeremiah said, you know, Lord, I'm tired. I am tired of prophesying. I will not say a word on your behalf again. And not two chapters after he cried out, Oh Lord, thy word is like a fire shut up in my bones. I can't help, but I have to speak it. When the word is dwelling in you, it's a holy fire. The word of God will burn. It will burn the doubt away. It will burn the sin away. It will make you stronger. It will make you wiser. Get the word in. Abide. Let the word. If my word abide in you. If my words abide in you. You shall ask what you will. Hallelujah. 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 